Um, first off, I'd like to thank Aveline and Dave uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I feel very privileged uh, to celebrate uh, the, the end of Black History Month, uh, yet another year with, with, with an event like this. Um, you know, I try and do as many of these as I can, uh, not because it's Black History Month, because I feel like it's needed in our community. And, uh, you know, I take a real sense of pride in trying to give back to the city that has given so much to me. Um, I've been through a lot of trials and tribulations like most of us, um, but if there's anything that I could say about us as, as a culture, as a people, is that we're uh, resilient, um, we're strong, and uh, you know, more often than not, we'll never take no for an answer. And if there's anything that we can instill in our young people moving forward, is the same things. And I think sometimes that gets lost uh, only because there's so many more distractions than there were when we were growing up. And now I could understand why my parents got so pissed at me all the time. <laughs> I mean, back then we had Atari and we had Nintendo, but now it's just to a whole nother level. They don't appreciate what human interaction is. They play on PlayStation, smartphones, iPads, and we're starting to lose our edge a little bit. So as if there's anything that I could preach or say um, that when we leave here today is that Black History Month should be celebrated every single day of this year. Amen. It should be um, something that we're proud of, something that we don't try and change, but we try and instill. And even when our young ones continue to be on their phones and and, and, and on their PlayStations, we have to make sure that they take the time to read, make sure they take the time to understand that um, interaction, personality, problem solving, uh, being educated is the way to go. Uh, you know, I have a 19-year-old son, and I'm having a few challenges with him now. You know, he feels that he's at a point that he knows everything, and as much as I try and tell him is the more he decides to want to do his own thing. And sometimes I get caught in being frustrated and saying, well, you know, maybe he should just figure it out for himself. But there's a little voice at the back of my mind that says, you know, you gotta stay with them because they don't have the same values, the same understanding that my parents instilled in me because I didn't have a lot of the distractions that they may have nowadays. So I always have to find, try and find myself being a little bit more understanding. And I'm very hard-headed because that's the only way I feel to learn. You learn, you make a mistake, we all make mistakes. Even me now to this day, I still do a lot of stuff. And the key is not doing it over and over and over again. And that's where I, I'm having a challenge with him, you know, and he, he wants to go to school, but he doesn't want to go to school, and it's just, it's just a tough situation, but you always have to continue to be patient and continue to talk to them, and over and over again, and eventually they'll get it. Because, to be honest, I'm 40 years young, and I'm starting to get, my, 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 my um, bones and my joints are starting to ache me, so. <laughs> I, I realized that, you know, one of these days he's going to have to take care of me. And the, and the only way for him to do that is for me to put him in a position to succeed. So I got to continue to be patient, like you guys as well. Uh, you may not have kids that are in the house, but you know somebody in the neighborhood. You have your friends' neighbors, you have whoever, your nieces, your nephews. And uh, let's, let's make sure that we acknowledge that and try and do what we can because it's an ongoing process. Even with our basketball team, it's like, today they asked me a question, well, how come pa Pascal Siakam is so good? What have you been doing with him? And the first thing I said is like, I work with him, yes, but it takes a village. You know, it's just not me. It's, it's the coaches watching film. It's me out on the court working him out. It's, it's him, him doing his due diligence. Um, and that's where you're seeing the growth. That's where you're seeing the improvement. So it's not a one-person show. It's a whole village. 
And we have to be able to um, look out for each other. You know, the mentality and the stigma out there so often than not is that, you know, it's every man for themselves. And in the NBA, it kind of is, but at the same time, it's a team game. And we have to look at life like that too. You know, we have to help one another. The only way that we're going to receive our blessings is to give and not just expect all the time. And I mean, I, I could go on and on and on, but these are kind of the things I wanted to leave you guys with uh, because it's very important to me. You know, I've been born and raised in Toronto. I grew up in North York, uh, ended up going to a school in Scarborough called Wexford Collegiate for two years, and then I transferred to Eastern Commerce, played another two years. I'm kind of going back, but uh, uh, this is for people that don't know who I am. Um, went, went on a scholarship to the University of Kentucky. I went there for four years, and then I was drafted and played in the NBA for 12, and now I've been coaching with the Raptors for the last seven. So my life has had a lot of ups and downs. It's taken a 360 degree turn. You know, I grew up here from when I was born to 18, left the house for 15, 20 years, and I was able to play and be the first Canadian to come back and play uh, for the team that I was from, in the city that I'm from. And that doesn't happen in the NBA too often and not. So it's something I'm very proud of. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I continue to do all my community service is because I have a certain correlation with this city, whereas maybe Damar or Kyle or Kawhi, though they love this city, they're not from here. So I'm gonna continue to do my work each and every day. It never stops, but it, again, it takes a village. It's gonna take all of us. And um, just know that um, you know we love you guys and, and we want what's best and we wanna have a great world. So with that being said, I'd like to thank Abilene and Dave Omo, I'm curious to hear what Desmond has to say. Probably a lot more uh, interesting than me, <laughs> but it's okay. And uh, for all those um, Toronto Revelers in here, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Toronto Revelers is a, is a float that I do for Caravana each and every year, and that's one of the ways that I think I could continue the culture and keep it going is because um, my son is born American. I was born in Toronto, though my parents are from Trinidad. So if I don't continue to do this on and on again, I feel like we're going to lose our culture. And uh, as you guys know, Toronto, Ontario has so many different cultures and ethnicities that we have to somehow keep it engaged. And as the, the generations go down and down, you know, they're going to be Canadian or American. So whatever we could do to keep this thing going, you know, whether it's Black History Month or Caravan or anything, at, you know, ethnic, let's continue to do it. Let's continue to support it because I was surprised to see so many people here today, you know, based on the weather and the conditions and stuff like that. So I really commend you guys for coming out here. So give yourselves a round of applause. And um, again, thank you for the opportunity and I'm looking forward to meeting you guys before I leave here today. Thank you. <laughs>